At Ohio State, we have a very large cohort of ibrutinib treated patients. We um, have a group of 308 patients that were treated on four clinical trials that we've been following um, to look at drug discontinuation and to look at mechanisms of resistance in those patients. So we have a median follow-up of 3.4 years. So most of our patients have been on the drug for a very long period of time. Um, and in that time, we've had uh, 27 patients progress with Richter's transformation and 55 progress with CLL. Um, Richter's tends to be in more early phenomena usually occurring within the first 18 months and pretty rare after two years, whereas people progressing with CLL on ibrutinib tend to do so after two years of treatment. Um, and we found that of 46 patients where we had samples on at the time of relapse, um, uh, 87 percent of them had developed mutations in either BTK or PLC gamma 2 at the time of relapse so kind of verifying that these are really the most predominant mechanisms by which people relapse and the majority of patients did have BTK C41 mutations so at the binding site of ibrutinib um, we also then since we know that people develop these mutations at relapse we're able in many cases to go back and look at serial samples that we've saved and we found that the, um, we could actually detect those clones prior to the development of clinical relapse at a median of 9.3 months. So a pretty long time between when we can first develop, detect a clone and when they relapse, suggesting there might be a potential for targeting that time period. Uh, we also looked prospectively and determined that we yes, can detect these clones prospectively in a clinical setting. Um, and like I mentioned on the MORE 208 study, for some of those patients who developed these resistant subclones, we're then adding MORE 208 to ibrutinib.